After hosting so many readings, who knew that doing it through the school was the answer to get everyone here sober? Um, the first poem is called Speaking of Marriage. Each word spoken satisfies. My love comes at the close. Parts from me listening to the wind beat in the open mouth of the cave, leaving behind echoes as real as if they were here, wistfully talking with one another the words return as if having been away for a long time. Context, right, okay. Um, I wrote a book of poems, um, and they didn't really fall in any order. They were just written over the course of a year. Um, some of them were written while I was away out of the country, and, um, but most of the ones I'm reading tonight, actually, I'm pretty sure almost all of them I'm reading tonight were written here in the Hudson Valley. The motions, where wave met wave coming back from beyond, another carries with it earth full and deep, the house along the way hidden, then uncovered by a glance, all of it, part of it. Mushroom picking, you stop to examine some mushrooms smelling like shit or autumn, Fallen logs, wrinkles along the back of your dress. Something of lightness settles over me, seeing you so out of place. There's a pond off down the hill. That, too, seems out of place. And what of the shovel? Could I dig if you asked into the feel of the evening? Another return. This is written after a Robert Creeley piece called The Return. To return, to perceive, to dance, to sing, to perceive, to return, to base, to laugh, to cry, to perceive, to accomplish, to glory, to return, to rhythm, to liquefy, to think, to differentiate, to voice, to mold, to return, to I, to die, to live, to return, to perceive. And this is um, a longer piece written in parts, and I'm going to kind of forego indicating when the parts begin and end. I'm just going to read it through. The way to stone. The stone further from shore in the ripples, arches, sinking beneath the surface. In a quarry near Pittsburgh, nothing to say. I will say nothing. Tomorrow will fill with the same moments of resistance, only wearing a new face. We follow a trail of care and deeper into the day, our patience can no longer resist the stillness of stone. Men in suits skipping stones in Azalea Pond, Highlanders in Scotland tossing boulders in the heather moorlands, a Soto monk raking pebbles tranquilly in Hokkaido, fence of limestone, county bluegrass in central Kentucky along a one-lane road, someone calling from a distance. He has become strong. He is skin. In his belly, he is hands. All his sisters have gone away. He has frightened them off. He remembers once as children sitting on father's blue stone pile in the front yard, white lichen, three seats, then two, now one. He looks at the marble before him, white, sensuous body. He has become strong. The marble veins form a face, some face of blue stone, bright and quick. He finds his shape and begins to chisel away. Heavy, red, iron, oxidized monument, US 163, people the world still like way before. I lied, this actually, this was written in Iran. After the party, near the steps to the garden, a bird perches on a bodak bush I finish another glass of wine. The company is gone. A field lies before me, meshed by paths and roads. Someone hesitates, passing the other side of the door. Bird rustles. I watch the moon through new eyes. My instrument has become empty balcony, empty field. And this is my final poem. Her. The curve of her back arches in withdrawal. Autumn. Fallen logs, the panting, mouthless river. Thank you.
Um, so what I'm reading here is an excerpt from my uh, senior project, which was a novella um, titled Above Water. The smokers would leave the baseball field through a tear in the wire fencing in the corner of the lot. Seniors used to be allowed to leave for lunch periods, but the policy was revoked after a student got drunk at a classmate's house and crashed her car on the way back to school. Maxwell kept a soft pack of Marlboro Red 72s in the breast pocket of his jean jacket, collar up and fraying at the neck. He kept, he kept a half-empty matchbook in a pocket also, afraid to carry more than four or five at a time. No lighters. You could tell the smokers from the non-smokers at a distance by the light brown mud caked at the heels of their shoes, a mixture of sand and dirt from the field's edge by the broken fence. Maxwell went for his cigarettes at the beginning of the lunch period before the baseball team and the few other boys made their way outside. He smoked the red 72s because they were shorts, burning for four or five minutes at most. Maxwell used his last match to light the cigarette and he tore the leftover cardstock into several small pieces before letting it flake to the ground. He stomped out the butt in the dirt before picking it back up again. Soctoma told him how to field strip a cigarette. It was something army men did, the cigarette butt torn into surfaces more easily accepted by the ground. The scratched leather of Maxwell's boots absorbed the mud into its creases, each step sucking him down half inch. He used a stick from a broken branch to scrape the mud from his shoes before going back inside. The art room was damp, the windows sealed from an unfinished construction project in the back of the building. The school lost tax money after elections changed the local government. The extended wing abandoned halfway through the building process. Thick black tarps slid in the inside of the frames, sealed with black tape. Students hung their misprints on the window tarps, so dense in places the sheets of paper would overlap a few layers through. There was a very large linoleum table in the center of the room, surrounded by two dozen metal stools. Maxwell ate his lunch in here most days, a small radio on a filing cabinet, usually playing rock cassettes. A few other students ate in the room too, mostly while working on their projects. Maxwell was not an artist, nor in any art classes that year, but no one seemed to notice or care. Catherine, also a senior, could be found in the art room during her free periods, carving scraps of wood from rectangular blocks. Her fingers were wrapped in tape and bandages, mostly to prevent the sharp tools and splinters from cutting her hands. Maxwell watched her make these woodcuts from across the room, her back arched on a stool over the table. Some of the fabric from her bandages was beginning to fray, tiny strings, dan strings dangling from her fingers. Catherine only changed focus to turn over the cassettes or to turn up the volume on the stereo before returning to her corner stool. Maxwell spoke to her for the first time when she was struggling with the crank of the printing press, a weighted mechanism controlling a large blast cylinder that rolled across the table. He asked if there was any way he could help, careful not to sound patronizing. She nodded, showing him the clamps at the table's edges to keep the paper in place. The screws were rusted and hard to turn, forcing her to hold her paper steady with one hand while trying to crank with the other. Maxwell left the room and returned with a small tin of oil from an unlocked janitor's closet. Do you have any towel or cloth for this in here? He asked. We need to apply a small amount to the threads and I'm afraid I'll get the table slick. Carefully, Catherine unwrapped some of the bandages from her hands, revealing patches of cracked dry skin and shallow cuts from her tools. A long deep scar ran across her index finger. Maxwell dabbed the oil on the fabric and lightly brushed the screws, using the dry side of the bandage to grip and turn until the screw finally budged. Maxwell crouched on the ground to secure the shaky legs of the table while Catherine made her prints. When they were finished, Maxwell stood up, eager to see what she had made. In dark blue ink, a few curved shapes marked the center of the page. What happened to your hand? Maxwell asked, the blue ink approaching the skin of her scarred finger. It took me a while to figure out how to do this. My first time, my grip on the wood was too close to the blade and I gashed my finger. It ruined the print, but I kept the one with the blood spots. Catherine put her hand in her pocket abruptly. This is just the first layer. I have to do three more. Can you stay to help? Maxwell was smoking his cigarette one lunch period when a small bird flew too close to his ear. He swatted it away, but the bird returned, trying to perch on Maxwell's head or shoulders. 
The bird chirped as it flew, a loud shrill sound that pierced him to his temple. In one motion, Maxwell grabbed the bird and crushed it in his palm. He felt the bones snap in his grasp and dropped the bird in disgust. He heard the sounds of voices approaching and quickly picked up the bird and shoved it into his jacket pocket before heading back through the fence and walking across the field. In the art room, Maxwell was looking through the cassettes while Catherine was making prints. Maxwell's denim jacket was draped over one of the stools near Catherine's corner. How do you feel about Simon and Garfunkel? He asked, turned back to her. My parents used to play Kathy's song all the time for me when I was younger, so I'm sick of them. Pick something else. Catherine walked around to the other side of the press to change the sheets of paper, moving Maxwell's stool out of her way. Something small and brown fell to the floor. She bent down to pick it up. What? Just... Oh, God, she said, recoiling from the bird. Why do you have this in your pocket? Maxwell froze. I don't... I found it outside, and I didn't know. As he turned around, Catherine could see that his slightly open palm was stained with blood. Catherine closed her open mouth and half-stepped backward. She spoke quietly. I don't think you should eat here anymore. The next day, Maxwell did not return to the hole in the fence, instead walking his, to his truck across the parking lot. He opened the door and swung into the driver's seat, lighting a cigarette between his teeth. Putting the car in gear, he drove out of the lot and onto the street. He braked, thinking, and then accelerated in the direction of the Applewood Diner. For my senior project, I wrote a collection of essays called Beautiful Young Female Maniac. Um, there are it's a little bit of everything. It's a little bit of art criticism, a little bit of film, a little bit of music. Um, the essay I'm going to be reading from is called What's It Like to Be a Girl in a Band, about um, Kim Gordon from Sonic Youth. Um, but the excerpt that I'm going to be reading is actually not about Kim. When I was in middle school, there was a girl whose house I used to go over to just so I could be around her older sister. Her older sister, Paige, was, in her family's eyes, just like any other sullen teenager who made things unpleasant for everyone, kicking up a fuss at dinner, skulking around corners, sleepy like a house cat, then suddenly alert and impatient. When you haven't yet hit puberty, when you still get along with your parents and haven't kissed boys, Adolescent rebellion seems like the most radical, punk rock gesture that you can possibly make. To me, she was everything. Paige was a rock star, and I was her devoted, albeit covert, groupie. I had to worship her from afar for fear that her sister would find me out, discover that our relationship was a sham, based only on my hopes of becoming friends with her big sister. Paige had found salvation in alternative music, giving the proverbial finger to authority. She made it a point to ignore anyone she deemed unworthy of her attention, which seemed to be mostly everyone, myself included. Paige was cool, cerebral, and indifferent. She had lank, wheat-colored hair that she'd cut herself into a blunt and nameless style. She wore chunky boots and black rubber bands around her wrists. When you spoke to her, she would blink at an unusually slow rate, so that most of the time you were talking to her, you weren't even looking into her eyes, as if to say, I'd rather be asleep than talking to you. <laughs> her bedroom was in the attic of her family's brownstone. <laughs> the ceilings, low and slanted, were covered in drawings and stickers. Above her desk was a Gorilla Girls poster, a picture of a reclining female nude with a beastly gorilla head attached to her shoulders. Next to the image, in thick black lettering, it read, Do women have to be naked to get into the Met Museum? Her room had orange plastic deco chairs, paper lanterns, a white shag carpet, stacked milk crates full of vinyl records. Once, while talking to Paige, I watched as she casually carved a pentagram into her desk with a key. 
The room could just have easily belonged to a teenager from the 1960s or 70s, but there seemed to be something organic about it all, not a recreation of someone else's room, as if all cool teenage girls have, throughout time, naturally been drawn to shag rugs and Eames knockoffs. <laughs> what do we mean when we say something is timeless? Time doesn't really push things forward. It just spits things back like a dirty, diseased ocean, depositing the same lost objects onto the shore again and again. Most days after school, my friend and I would hang out on a stoop, bent over massive slices of pizza, passing back and forth a can of warm Coke. Mine or yours was the eternal question. Yours. It was always hers, and soon it stopped even being a question. It was a time when we were just beginning to be embarrassed about using the word playdate. Eleven-year-olds didn't have playdates. They hung out or chilled. Everything was chill. That girl's poem was chill. That cute boy was chill. They, um, your friend's mom was chill about you sleeping over. We'd get our slices and eat them on the walk to our house in the West Village. It was the first year our parents let us walk home alone. Paige was, to my disappointment, often not there when we arrived, but when she was, you knew it right away, because a discordant, gritty sound of her plugging into her, into her amp would waft down the four flights from her bedroom. Paige played the bass, a cream-colored fender that she'd strum over and over, letting the feedback wobble all over the room. She played with her head bent all the way down, preoccupied with what her fingers were doing. She wasn't very good, but her commitment was impressive. <laughs> the history of punk, after all, is a history of people picking up instruments who really have no business doing that at all. <laughs> punk is the only kind of music I can think of where not practicing your instrument is seen as an advantage. The only time Paige ever let us into her room was when she wanted to play us something. It was hard to come up with language to express our approval for what she was playing, mostly because we didn't really know what it was. There were no hooks, no verses, just clashes of electric sound that rattled the windows and made her cat, Maxie, leap from the bed fretfully before fleeing through the cracked door. Our responses were never more than a few words, mumbles of excellent and awesome and really good. <laughs> what do 11-year-olds know about post-punk garage music anyway? But even just a thumbs up usually seemed to satisfy her. A sheepish grin spreading on her face, her attempt to fight a full-on smile. She'd murmur, cool, thanks, before, um, you can go now. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Um, so I made a fantasy journal, and it's called Kitab. And I actually have no idea what Mary is reading, so it's a surprise to me too. I just got tired of hearing my voice, and I like the idea of knowing how it's received by everybody. So Mary, if you'd be so kind. This is from Kitab by Najm Haq. And this is a uh, halfway through, a little more than halfway through actually, of his uh, novel. My eyes open, I'm awake, chained. These words are being made without my touch in this kitab which is out of sight. I feel the record, the transfer of sensation, the holding of thought and the vision of my mind's eye. There is a space that exists before one can see that opens after sensation is experienced. I feel this space open in dream, in record, in memory. Andalus, how do I get back to you? I want to see you again. I want to see my people. I see bars. I'm in a cell. Frustrated, I thrash about. The noise catches the attention of the guard. You're finally awake. What's going on? Why am I shackled? We found you wandering the streets. You were asleep, mumbling about Ashka and Andalus. You know those names? Of course. We figured you escaped, but he said you were different. He wanted to talk to you the moment you woke up. Him? Escaped? The elder, let's go. You can ask him all these questions. I'm allowed to unchain you, but only if you give no problems will there be any problems. I shake my head no. We leave the cell. As we walk, I gain no better sense of where I am. I would run, but where to? We enter a grand throne room. In the center sits Shai. He wears a large flowing robe and is adorned with jewels. 
He holds my kitab, I'm speechless. He breaks the silence. Welcome home, I've been reading your kitab, it's quite fascinating. You realize most of it doesn't make sense, right? That's all you have to offer me? After everything that's happened, the best I get is a weak insult? I demand answers, Shah, you owe me that much. What's going on? Honestly, I didn't believe it was you when the guards told me. Who did you expect? What's the meaning of all this? Honestly, I thought one of the witnesses returned. Witnesses? I'll explain later. I need to know, though, why haven't you aged, Orya? I was about to ask you how you got so much older than before. Time moves differently outside of Andalus, but you look exactly as you did all those years ago. All those years? Ten years ago, when you ran away. Ten years? Sounds impossible, right? Well, it shouldn't have been possible to bypass the gates. It shouldn't have been possible to record a dream. It shouldn't be possible that you are alive. What happened, Oria? I don't know. I stepped out of the gate and was in the wasteland. I have no answers about the dream, about what happened at Andalus. You happened. Tensions were high enough when you were around. An outsider, as a scribe, ludicrous, every day of your training was a strike against our people. Your accomplishments and praise from Firdus was just nauseating. Neither scribe nor forger respected your status. Do you realize how lucky you were? If you were found by anyone other than Firdos, you would have been an ordinary citizen. That is on your shoulders. This is all from your greed. No, I was given a message. I was called by our prophet. You were responsible for our fall. The houses went to battle because Firdos refused to reveal your recorded dream. His loyalty to you was unwavering. You couldn't stand the thought of losing your ability to record. Your selfishness destroyed Andalus. I didn't know Firdus. Gone, they are all. The beast leaves no survivors. I can't process this. I always believed I could go home. The beast, you said there was a war. There was. I ended it. Thank you. All right, so I wrote a young adult novel in the form of a diary, and the piece I'll be reading is um, a conversation between this girl, Lizzie, and her new stepfather, Ralph. February 28th, Saturday. The hose froze. Now it's in my bathtub. Ralph and I actually had a conversation. This morning, Mom left early for her doctor appointment because she had to rush Basil to the vet. He jumped on the counter and swallowed a bunch of Gorilla Glue that Ralph had been using to fix a tiny crack in one of the cabinets, which had been there ever since the house was first built. Ralph was pissed that Basil had ruined a brand new bottle of Gorilla Glue, and that stuff is expensive, you know. But Mom knows, and I know, and Penny knows that you can't leave anything on the counter that you don't want eaten, and especially not anything that would be dangerous if it were eaten. Mom was strangely cool-headed about the whole thing. She just said that Ralph needed to be more careful next time. I don't think Ralph realizes how angry she is. So, yeah, Mom left, Mom left and Penny was sleeping in because she always does, which meant that I was left alone with Ralph all morning. I was minding my own, eating my cereal peacefully, when Ralph walked in and decided willy-nilly that he was going to make enough pancakes for China, even though I would be the only other person there to eat them. I don't know why I feel so peeved about Ralph making pancakes. It's a perfectly nice gesture. I feel like even if he gave me a thousand dollars, I'd find a reason to be bitter about it. Anyway, so Ralph made pancakes along with a really tasty blueberry compote from all the blueberries Mom had been planning to feed to Bonnie to supplement her diet because she's been constipated lately. Speaking of Bonnie, she was being a real pain when we finally sat down to eat. Ralph yelped, Whoa there, what are you doing? Trying to lick the food off my plate, eh? Does your mom, al does your mom always let her stick her snout up your armpit? Why, she's worse than a piggy. Ralph talked about this time he sailed with a pig on board. One of his mates had won the pig in a card game, but since he couldn't find anyone to take care of it when he went on a six-month sailing trip, his mate decided to bring the pig along. That was a great pig, Ralph began. Well, at first, she wasn't so great. We called her Piggy. She'd leave her droppings strewn all about. She'd get seasick. She'd fall off the boat just about every day. But it was all right, you know. Eventually, she learned to swim quite well. We used a kind of net to hoist her back onto the boat. Piggy would get very upset when we dock and have to leave her. She'd squeal like she was headed for slaughter. One time, someone stole Piggy and was going to bash her in the head because of her squealing, but luckily we made it in time and clocked him a good one so that didn't happen. 
I ate my, pan my pancakes quietly, not sure how I felt about Ralph clocking somebody a good one. After enough awkward silence, I asked him why he likes sailing and studying boat plans. He says he loves the silence and the sound of the water against the hull. It's very serene. It's just you, your mates, your boat, and the ocean. That's it. Sometimes it's easy to sail, sometimes it's not. The water can be your friend, or it can be trying to kill you. And then it's a struggle of your will against nature's. Nothing is more exquisite. He wishes he could take his son sailing so they wouldn't get involved in nasty things but his ex-wife never allows it. I asked him why not. She gets very uptight about them missing school. She places so much importance on their academic education. She's so bogged down. She can't open her mind and rise above this earthly realm to see that the boys will go astray without an education, without something to nourish the body and the soul. She's very sad, she is. A very sad excuse for a mother. Then Ralph asked what time it was because he wanted to catch a radio program hosted by Kenny Richard, his favorite cult leader whose main tenet is that people are poor because they are sinners and God is cursing them. I checked my phone and saw that it was two something the afternoon. He noticed my phone's background, which was a picture of a shirtless, shirtless emo band member flexing his abs on a beach. I don't even know what band the guy was from since Hannah put it on there. She thought it would be funny to change my background one day while I was peeing. I thought it was a funny picture, too, so I never got around to changing it. Anyway, Ralph went into this whole story that I really did not want to hear about his son Theo's porn addiction. <laughs> I was using his computer to check my email when I noticed some folders with pictures of naked women. He's still young now, and he was so young then. It just floored me. So I tried talking to Theo about the photos he was seeing and explaining to him that over time, his mind will become defiled and will think only unclean thoughts. Sex is not something dirty. Rather, it is a sacred unif unification, a give and take between a man and a woman. But looking at your phone just now, I've realized that maybe the young people's desire to see these sort of photos is natural. Not right, certainly, but natural, perhaps. Um, so I wrote uh, nonfiction pieces based off of interviews with former inmates about their lives before, during, and after prison. It's all about being smart, just living, how to survive. You know when you open up a can and you have the can top? That's a knife. Definitely something you learned in there, and you learned it quick. You have to. Her two-inch long fake fingernail stabbed a buffalo wing. She brought it to her mouth and sank her teeth into it. Orange sauce immediately outlined her lips, and she ran her tongue along her lower lip, her eyes focusing on something out the window. She did not wipe her mouth. Instead, she shook the wing until it loosened its grip around her nail and fell to the plate. Then she picked up her fork and began to work on the three eggs on the neighboring plate. I had asked her how the food was in prison. She said, not good. Tanya was in prison for three and a half years. It's been about two years since being released. Her big silver hoops swung with each motion of her head. She was wearing ripped jeans and a studded New York baseball hat. It was the first time I saw her out, out of church clothes. She grew up in Orlando, Florida. She told me that people are products of their environment, and unfortunately that she is included in that category. She was raised by her grandmother and living with 13 other children. She shared a room with her five brothers. Drugs surrounded her. At age 14, she was going to bars and had aborted a child conceived with one of her brothers. At age 16, after two years of still living in the same room as the father of the unborn child, she went to her grandmother, who knew about the rape by her brother, and asked to be emancipated. The reply she got was a simple, fine. No disagreements, no struggles, no protests, no I love yous. No sorries for the dreadful life she had led thus far, and certainly no acknowledgement that what her brother did was wrong. One day after she was emancipated, Tanya walked into a candy store. It was there that she met Doug, or Husky, as he was known on the streets. He was eight years older than her, and he bought her an ice cream cone. Candy inside, drugs outside. She had been dating him for a year when she discovered she was pregnant. She was 16. She was four months pregnant, and she told him, excited. You know that I love you, he told her. Then he punched her in the stomach, hard. He walked out the door, leaving her on the floor alone. Tanya reported him, and he went to jail for one month. Tanya was six months pregnant now. She was walking on the street when Husky rode up to her on his motorcycle. He grabbed her hair and dragged her behind his bike. She broke three toes and died on the operating table in the hospital. The doctors brought her back to life, but she didn't believe it was them. It was God that brought me back. She had a healthy baby girl. It wasn't until Tanya went to Kingston that prison became a larger possibility for her. 
She was more involved in the drug process there, and she eventually got caught. She moved between four prisons during her three-year sentence. Maximum security was better, more chillaxed. Minimum security was stricter. Think of it this way. People are doing 25 years to life in maximum, and then you have people in minimum who are doing a couple years and coming home. In maximum, some people are not coming home, so the officers are not as strict with the enforcement of the rules. She explained to me that the dirtier prisons were the better ones for her, the maximum security ones, the ones that don't have all the rules where people actually follow them, the ones that were predominantly African American and Hispanic. There were 90 women to a unit. There was cattiness, there was pettiness, there was jealousy. People could fight over anything. If you didn't follow the rules, you could get tickets or go to lockup or sent to solitary confinement. Tanya was in lockup around 14 times, and throughout her entire sentence, she spent seven months in solitary, mostly because of fighting. She spent 23 out of 24 hours a day locked in the cell. She took only two showers a week. So far, every time I've seen Tanya, her hair has been perfectly straightened, nails perfectly manicured. She takes very good care of herself and takes pride in looking good. I cannot imagine a Tanya with no showers or using her mattress to iron her clothes or curling her hair with paper and lighting a match. I couldn't stand being in the shoe. I almost lost my mind in the shoe. And not because I don't like being alone, because I enjoy being alone. When you're in the shoe, you have nothing. You have no private property, no food. You just have you in the cell and maybe a couple of reading materials, and that's it. When she wasn't in solitary or in lockup, Tanya worked in her dorm as a porter. She had the morning module, so she would get up in the morning, clean the dorm, and then go lay down and take a nap. She would just bullshit around. There are no activities in prison, at least in women's prison. The men's facilities have more than the women do. Women have nothing. At this point, the many rings on her fingers began beating down on the table. Click, 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 clack, clickety clack. It was like a neurotic impulse and it was the only thing that I could focus on. Her eyes were distant and she ignored a call from her son. When her husband called, however, she picked up. She told him she was doing an interview and asked him to call back in an hour. When I asked if everything was okay, she responded with a simple, oh yeah, he's in prison, so I had to let him know when to try again. She said it so nonchalantly. Here's a woman where drugs and prison has always been a part of her life, yet she doesn't appear to be letting it get her down. She goes to church every Sunday, knows the entire congregation, participates in shows, is currently getting her bachelor's, and still has time to take phone calls from her incarcerated husband and take care of her little, of her little boy, all the while still trying to get back to her two other children. She finishes her eggs. There's no reason even I should have done four years. Then they have these prisons. They mix you in. I have a, I have a possession charge, and I'm mixed in with a murderer. She'll be your bunkie. There's no separation at all, and that's why a lot of people get killed in prison. Because you know in men's prison, they don't accept child molesters and people who rape women. They don't accept that. You get killed for that. But the women, they're more accepting of that craziness. And, you know, you just be mixed in. Tanya had said she was mostly sent to lockup or solitary because of physical fights. She told me about one fight. It was with her cellmate. She had a cellmate who was in prison because she allowed her husband to have sex with her daughter. Tanya could not deal with that because it went against her morals. She asked to be moved, and they told her she couldn't have things her way and to deal with it. So she dealt with it. Hi. Um, so I wrote a collection of fairy tales, and I'm going to read one very, very short story and then one slightly less short story. Um, this is called The Lady in Pink. The girl was young, seven or ten, and the dress was enormous on her, oceanic, pooling on the floor around her little bare feet. The dress was chalky pink, gauzy skirt, silken bodice with embroidered flowers, little cap sleeves, and garish. The young girl loved it, traded her school clothes for it the moment she got home. The dress had been meant for, to fit her mother, had been the bridesmaid's uniform at some wedding years before, before the girl was born, even. The girl knew it only as a mystery, a thing of beauty unearthed last night from the storage space in the basement that frightened her so, Excalibur freed from the stone. She thought her finding of the dress could have been perhaps in fulfillment of some prophecy. She thought perhaps, as happens with these things, it had really been the dress that found her. She loved the feel of it against her skin, the swish of it against the floor as she moved, careful not to trip over the excess length. She felt transformed, magnificent, complete. She felt older, more beautiful, and by extension better, kinder, wiser, as if she could break, perhaps, a curse, or kiss, perhaps, a prince. The house was mostly quiet, four-ish, Tuesday, the sun starting to slip from out the sky. Her mother had come home early, but was working at her computer in the office, had to work, couldn't play, she was sorry. After dinner, maybe she'd have time. But the girl felt an unmasterable need to be seen in the dress. 
She walked down the long white hallway, toe heel like a lady, to her mother's office, inched open the door, stopped in the doorway, waited for mom to turn around, turn her face away from the blue light of her computer screen and see her daughter and exclaim. The girl waited a long moment, her breath coming fast like the beating of little wings. Her feet hadn't made enough noise on the floor. The hinges of the door had not creaked quite enough upon its opening. Her mother still did not know the girl was there. The little girl leaned against the door frame and, to make her mother turn around, said into the room in a hushed whisper, like gossip spread by handmaids through the halls of a castle, like a rumor carried on the wind itself, like it was someone else speaking. Who is that mysterious lady? And then, this is also short. Um, this is called The Princess. The princess is in her pink bedroom, pressing her thighs together. She is 16. She wonders about this feeling, the friction of her skirts against her skin. She's not sure what it is she's doing or what it is she wants. The princess eats dinner with her parents, the king and the queen. She has trouble keeping spinach leaves on her fork, ends up taking bites too big, stems protruding from her mouth. The princess may have many virtues, but she is not a graceful eater. The princess has many suitors vying for her hand and, by extension, half the kingdom. She watches from her tower window every morning as they line up in the courtyard to complete the seven tasks her father has set forth as obstacles to her virginity and his countryside. Scaling the crystal pyramid, retrieving the golden ring from the wishing well, picking the one box containing the princess's golden necklace from a sea of identical boxes, separating grains of sugar from grains of salt, answering a riddle of some kind, crafting a pair of shoes to fit the princess's delicate feet, defeating the troll at quarterstaffs. The princess wakes up with a pimple on her chin the day that someone finally masters all these tasks. She pops it with her bare fingers, wiping away the bit of white ooze and then the bit of blood. The princess meets the man to whom she will be wedded on the day of their wedding. Her father, the king, gives her away. Her mother, the queen, cries quiet tears, at first for her daughter, but then suddenly for herself. It is a beautiful ceremony, all agree. The princess loses her virginity to her new husband on their wedding night. She is relieved to have it finally gone, a burden lifted from her shoulders. Maybe the world is open to her now. She can have an affair with the handsome stable boy. She can sunbathe naked on the tower roof. There is nothing fragile in her now, no barriers to the life she's always wanted, the love she's always craved. She thinks maybe she is free. Her husband now pulls out, rolls off of her. The princess drifts to sleep. Upon waking, the princess finds her arms are feathered things, her little blonde body hair is replaced with soft down. The princess rushes to her private dressing room, scratches at her arms like a wild thing. The feathers scrape off easily, drift from her body, and land in a soft pile on the carpet. I am becoming a bird, the princess thinks. Frantically, she looks back over all her days on earth for an action that could have triggered this. I have always been kind to ugly beggar women, giving them coins and giving them scraps in case they were cruel enchantresses in disguise. I have never taken a piece of jewelry from my own that was not rightfully mine to begin with, nor a rose, nor a horse, nor an anything. My parents slighted no one when they sent the invitations to my christening those 16 years ago. Nothing I have done should have given rise to this. I did not lose my virginity before my wedding night. Perhaps my husband once had another lover, one with magic, and in marrying me, he slighted her, and this is how she enacts her revenge. Is this the kind of thing one can confront one's husband about? As the sun rises, the princess sees her arms are only skin again. She is free to leave the privacy of her chambers, eat breakfast with her husband, return to the world. The princess has a busy day. She and her husband travel in the carriage to the castle that is now theirs. Her husband exclaims at the rolling hills, the peasants who newly are his subjects. There are receptions to be had. Dignitaries from other kingdoms arrive bearing gifts, attempting to curry favor with the new ruling couple. That evening there is a ball. The princess dances with her husband. She steps on his feet. The princess may have many virtues, but she is not a graceful dancer. That night, the princess and her husband once again have sex. It is better for her this time. She starts to understand what she has heard her serving women speak of. The princess rises in the middle of the night. What was it I just dreamt? I can't seem to remember. I blink the sleep from my eyes and find that I can see through the darkness, the room bathed in an eerie green light. What is happening? The moon is a huge round thing, the night breeze cool and fresh and rustling my feathers. I look down. My whole body is covered now in those same soft feathers from the morning. I will have to run a bath. Yet I cannot risk my serving woman's eyes. We'll have to figure out how it is a bath is run on my own. Where does the water come from? How is it heated? I think I've done it wrong because when I step in, the water is like ice, and it is all that I can do not to cry out. 
The water melts the feathers from my skin. The green glow fades from the room. All is shadow once again. The princess climbs back into her bed. Her husband snores on, ignorant. Weeks pass. The princess adjusts to this new life, hosting banquets and hearing peasants' complaints and riding through the countryside that once was her father's but now is her husband's and every night rising to wash away the feathers that spring from her skin. The princess returns to the sta stable after her ride one Tuesday. The stable boy is there, the one she had insisted they bring with them from her father's castle. The princess smiles at him shyly as she dismounts from her horse in a single move, but then trips over her own feet and falls directly into his arms in an embarrassing display. The princess may have many virtues, but... The princess and the stable boy linger in this position for longer than strictly necessary, bodies pressed close together. It is the late afternoon, it is summer and very hot. The princess knows the stable boy will never be the one to kiss her first. The princess knows that she's still passing as a princess. She leans in. Sex with the stable boy is so different from sex with her husband. Her husband treats her like something he has won through completing seven nigh impossible tasks. The stable boy treats her like one of the village girls he has seduced. Both still leave something to be desired. The feathers come in early that night, start forming even at the dinner table. The princess excuses herself, claiming illness, that her appetite is failing her. A rumor starts that the princess might be pregnant. What will I do? Already it's gotten so bad that I have to soak four hours before the feathers disappear. What will happen if? But then would it be so bad to become a bird completely? There could be a kind of freedom in that, finally. I press my thighs together in the bath, waiting for my feathers to dissolve, and imagine what it would feel like to fly. The sky dark, deep, velvety smooth, and littered with stars. The whistle of the wind, the thudding of my pulsing wings, the thudding of my pounding heart. The feel of the air surrounding me, the warm night air, the rush of the air, working its way between my feathers, beneath my wings, against my body, consuming me completely, moving over me, under me, carrying me onwards, upwards, 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 up. A feeling I never thought possible, trusting the air to bring me where I'm going, giving myself over to it, letting the air move me, letting go, just letting go, moving with it, into it, until we are one being. All other thoughts leave my mind. I am my wild body, just dancing with the sky. The attendant sent to check on the princess, hears her cry out through the door, bursts into the room uninvited, looks around frantically for her mistress who may well be in pain, sees only a large black bird flying out the open window and into the falling night. <laughs> <laughs>